I will go ahead and get us started, everyone. Welcome uh, to our Find Your Ancestor session for today. I'm Katie Stilp. I'm the local history librarian here at Appleton Public Library in Appleton, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for our webinar on researching German ancestry. Before we dive into today's program, I do have a couple quick announcements. First, for those who live locally, if you haven't yet heard, we will be soon moving to a new temporary location while we continue the renovations on our regular library building. To accommodate the move, um, our last day open will be this coming Tuesday, November 21st. So you definitely want to stop at the library to stock up before we close, since we'll be closed until the new year. Um, it takes that long to move all the library stuff, unassemble everything, reassemble everything, and get all set up, especially with the holidays in there. So we're going to reopen at our new temporary location at 3000 East College Ave on Monday, January 8th. During the closure, of course, you can feel free to use any other InfoSoup library um, that's in our system. And of course, our electronic resources are going to be always available. Uh, there is a link on the first page of the handout that has some details on that move and that closure for those who are interested. Also, I did want to quickly mention that we are currently fundraising for renovations for the library. We have a $500,000 matching grant to help us try and reach the remainder of our goal. So if you'd like to donate, your donation will be doubled, which is awesome. And you can make your donation in person at the library while we're open or visit friendsofapl.org slash donate. And I will throw that link into the chat in just a second here if you're interested in donating. Uh, the Friends of the Appleton Public Library um, who is leading that fundraiser is the same organization who provides funding for this Find Your Ancestors series and allows us to continue bringing such amazing speakers to everyone around the world completely for free every single month of the year. So we definitely could not do this without their support. And again, any donation is appreciated and is doubled and allows us to keep doing all this awesome work that we do. For those unfamiliar, the Find Your Ancestors series happens once a month, every month of the year. So definitely check out the handout. I've posted a link in the uh, chat and I'll post the link several times for those who are joining a little bit late. Um, so that link on the first page, you'll see some information on our upcoming programs with links to register for them. So our last session of the year is going to be Saturday, December 9th at 2 p.m. Central when we host genealogist Robin N. Smith to discuss making sense of all the research you're done, you've done at this point. Um, we'll kick off our 2024 series with Thomas McKenzie discussing 10 must-haves for genealogy success. Also in the handout is a link to our events calendar, or you can get to it from our website, apl.org. On the events calendar, you can view all the dates and topics for our whole 2024 series. So like I said earlier, we've got a great lineup of speakers. Um, so I hope you're at check us out and join them. Just a reminder, even if you do register for any of the upcoming programs today, you're going to get a reminder email a week before, a day before, and an hour before the program with the information on joining that program. If you've missed any of our past Find Your Ancestors sessions, definitely check out our YouTube channel. There's a link to that in the handout as well. Of course, not every presentation is recorded or up there indefinitely, so be sure you're registering and attending live if you're able to. We are recording today's session, and I will send a link out to that recording on Monday to everyone. A reminder that recording or capturing this presentation in any format without permission from our speaker and the library is prohibited. All the slides and handout materials are covered by copyright law. You are welcome to download and or print a copy of the handout for your personal use, but no portion of any material may be photographed, duplicated, or shared in any way without permission from our speaker. Closed captioning is enabled if you need it. You're able to push that bottom, that button at the bottom of your screen. Just be aware they're not 100% accurate since this is all, if this is a live transcript. If you need any other accommodations to enjoy today's presentation, just let me know in the chat. If you have any questions during today's session, you can use the Q&A box, which is located on the bottom of your screen, and we'll answer questions at the end. For any library-specific questions, or if you need any help navigating our library's genealogy databases, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is on that first page of the handout. I offer one-on-one -on -one sessions via Zoom or in person at the library when the library is open to help with any genealogy questions or show you our genealogy databases. So, if you're interested in that, see the link in the handout to book an appointment. And then finally, at the end of today's presentation, there's going to be a short survey that's going to pop up once you close out of Zoom. It's an American Library Association sponsored initiative. If you could just take a minute, it's a quick eight question survey, just letting us know what you thought of today's presentation. And we would greatly appreciate that. Without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today. Today we have Dave Miller. 
Dave has been researching family histories, including his own, for the past 40 years. He worked for almost 45 years in radio and television before retiring in July 2019. He has many family connections to Northeast Wisconsin. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from McMurray College in Jacksonville, Illinois, a Master of Arts degree from the University of Illinois Springfield, and a Professional Learning Certificate of Genealogical Studies in Irish Records from the National Institute for Genealogical Studies near Toronto, Ontario, where he not only studied Irish records, but also German and American records. Dave's German side emigrated from the Rhine, the Saarland, and what was the Kingdom of Bohemia. He records a monthly podcast on the IGSI YouTube channel and has appeared in three episodes of The Dead Files on the Travel Channel. He has also authored articles on many genealogy topics and speaks to groups on genealogy and their family history. His genealogy blogs and video blogs um, can be found at his website, theancestorgod.com. So everyone, welcome Dave. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to have everybody here. And uh, thanks to uh, Katie and to the Appleton Public Library for inviting me back again this year. And so uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Germanic ancestry. So um, for those of you who maybe know a little bit about the history of uh, what we refer to as the Federal Republic of Germany, it wasn't always that way. In fact, uh, in, in certain sections, we have areas that are part of another country, but they spoke German. So uh, we'll kind of get into that a little bit, and I've had to experience that as well. So as, um, as uh, Katie mentioned, uh, we just asked that uh, folks uh, please be able to uh, not record any of the devices. And if you want to mention on Facebook or Twitter, that's fine as well. Uh, originally, I come from Evanston, Illinois. I saw somebody from Arlington Heights on board here this afternoon. And uh, my family comes from uh, Northeast Wisconsin. Uh, I've been working in radio and television. I left that and I've been doing this for, it's been over 10 years now. So, and I have the uh, company we call the Ancestor Guy. And as uh, Katie mentioned in the intro here, um, so my family came from Darmstadt and from the Rhine and Saarland and from the Kingdom of Bohemia, which is uh, now part of the Czech Republic. So that adds more challenges if you're trying to. They spoke German, but it wasn't really part of Germany. So when you kind of write to the archives, you'd get back a, a response that wasn't necessarily in German. So what we're going to be discussing here in the next hour or so is going to be the uh, uh, why the ancestors spoke German, if they did, and were they really German? Were they from Germany or what we refer to now as the Republic of Germany? Um, researching American records, which is a kind of a good start, and we'll get into that as well, and understanding the history and the provinces and the kingdoms that make up what we refer to as Germany. So who needs to do German research and German genealogy? Well, you know, folks from uh, Germany and Austria and Switzerland, uh, they spoke in German as well parts of uh, Western Poland, the Czech Republic, and uh, even in parts of Hungary, there were uh, an some areas that were spoken German. Uh, Western Europeans, and keep in mind those borders were always in dispute. So uh, you, you might have seen some sections in France that were part of the uh, maybe part of the Rhine, and then all of a sudden Napoleon takes over and that area now becomes a uh, part of France. So uh, we'll run across some records where the German records were actually in French uh, for a short time. Okay, so from there, I might mention too that um, uh, I usually do my sessions with uh, Carrie Drayfall, and uh, so she and I put together um, uh, uh, programs, and uh, so uh, part of this comes from her as well. So thank her in addition uh, to uh, the, the, all the th things we've been able to put together for this program. So uh, back in, as I call it, the olden days, um, and this goes back to 1980, I'd write a letter to the uh, archive and, and Koblenz, and then uh, I'd get back maybe about a month or so later, uh, a nice letter. Uh, it was all in German. So unless you Unless your German was good, you know, then uh, you had some problems. I got lucky because I had a stepmother who knew German when she was from, had lived there for a while. So she uh, could translate some of that for me. And if I got in trouble, I usually got yelled at in German as well. So uh, that was always a standing joke at our place. But uh, at any rate, um, she, um, uh, the lady here, uh, sends me with uh, friendly greetings um, 
Uh, Ms. Weinberg uh, gives me the information in German, but I did get it translated. Now, as I mentioned in Bohemia, uh, we had in Western sections near Pilsen, you also had people that spoke German. And uh, now it is part of the Czech Republic. So when you get a hold of the archive over there, it would all be in Czech. So um, in some cases, you're able to uh, do some translation a little bit, but it wasn't the easiest thing to be able to do. Now it's a lot different. In fact, it's uh, totally different. You can find a lot of good information out of there. And um, uh, not only uh, are you able to find in some cases, and we'll show this to you in a little while, uh, the information to be in German, but you can also find an English version of that website as well. So uh, that helps a little bit in your, in your research if you're looking over the, on the other side of the pond to find uh, what you're looking for in your ancestors. So uh, some records obviously were destroyed due to conflicts and wars uh, throughout the uh, centuries uh, when we talk it, about German culture. And um, many records have been uh, digitized recently as well. And as I tell people, if you can't find it, check back a month from now because you might find some of those records uh, available down the road. And I'm gonna show you some examples of some of the sites that are out there and where you can find some of these sites. Now, even though, uh, in some areas, some records may not exist. In some cases, the uh, parish uh, would uh, make copies of them and send them off to different archives, or they were able to preserve some of those records before some battles would occur in certain areas. But this dates back to 1628, and this is obviously in the far western portion of what is now Germany. But uh, you can kind of see that uh, this baptismal record um, what you'll find is that, especially with Catholic records, they're all written in Latin. So whether you knew German, um, it would help. And then especially today, with sites like Ancestry, you can find um, some of the records. The transcription might also be in German, but when you use uh, the translators now, uh, it will actually translate it for you in English. So using the translator and browser, I use Firefox, but I've used Edge too as well. And so uh, you just get the uh, uh, translation program working on your uh, browser and you can get quite a bit of nice information that you wouldn't have had before. So where do we start? All right, well, as we take a look at uh, information, looking at naturalization, looking at U.S. Census records, obituaries, family Bibles, and family records, um, looking at surnames as well. And you can, we'll get into that a little bit as we head into this. So starting from this side of the pond is probably the best, um, best uh, solution uh, in finding that. The more information you have before you start looking overseas, the better off your success is going to be. And that's true, not just for German records, but French, Italian, Irish, English, uh, everything. Uh, they, the records are here and you can find some of these records. And the more you can put together before you start heading over there, or if you've been planning a trip or, or you're just gonna start looking uh, at some of the databases over there, the better you are when you have all that information together. So looking at family records, looking at obituaries, looking at vital records and even church records. If the vital records didn't exist in certain areas, maybe the church records will be able to provide you with some more information. Um, military records, obviously land records and uh, cemetery records, uh, passenger lists. We have a few examples of those as well. And the uh, county histories. Those are to me, some of the um, underused in, in research. Uh, take a look at some of the county histories. You can go to uh, your library nearby and see if they have a county history, especially if you're in that area or check with the library in the area where your ancestors came from. And you might be able to find some information uh, about that. And they may go into more detail than you ever expected. And I've run across that as well myself. The key in successful family research, as I mentioned, is to find those immigrant ancestors here in America before you start looking overseas. And if we go, um, maybe looking at uh, Civil War records, um, you might have found that uh, some of your ancestors fought in the Civil War. Here's uh, something from the National Park Service. It's called the Soldiers and Sailors Database, and it includes both Union and Confederate regiments. So if your ancestor may have been uh, come over from Germany and, and fought in the uh, American Civil War, which is certainly possible, here's a... a, a uh, 
idea right here of uh, Jakob uh, Kurlinger, who fought in Company G in the 16th Regiment in the Illinois Cavalry. And you can find out more of the when he uh, participated in the uh, American Civil War and uh, how long he may have been there. And then you could find to see if he had any veteran uh, information. And that might even give you some details as to where that ancestor came from specifically. i give you another example was uh, um, the 9th Ohio Infantry Regiment was an all German unit. So some of them were German descendants or some of them actually were, came over from Germany and, and fought in the Civil War in the Union Army. And one of the battles they fought at was in uh, Nicholas County in 1861, uh, which is now part of West Virginia. So, um, you know, you might find some of those regiments that uh, had uh, um, your ancestor in there because that person, if it were, they were here at that time, they fought in the American Civil War. And some, even the Hessians have fought in the American Revolution. Now, as I was telling Katie just a second ago, this is kind of breaking news because I accidentally ran across some of this. There's a site called the American Battlefield Trust. And um, I'll call this up here because I don't have it on the handout, but uh, you might look at it at uh, battlefields.org. And it talks about how Hessian troops fought in the American Revolution for the British. In fact, what happened was they rented the Hessian troops from uh, Frederick II, who was the leader of uh, Hesse at the time. And um, getting that money from the British uh, allowed them to lower his taxes a little bit. So he had kind of a different way of doing things than uh, probably the way we would do it today. But uh, uh, so you, we had a number of Hessian troops that fought in the American Revolution. Another site is called, it was the Mount Vernon site where uh, George Washington lived and died and is interred right now. And so um, mountvernon.org, and uh, this is the site for that. And it talks more about um, where the British were at the time. And uh, there was a gentleman that wrote this uh, article that, that you can find on this page. And I'll wait another second so that you can uh, write it all down. And uh, but you can find it also at uh, by just going to mountvernon.org and looking up the uh, Hessian uh, page. Uh, one of the things that they mention is the fact that, that Washington won the Battle of Trenton due to the fact of light resistance by the Hessian troops um, at the Battle of Trenton on December 26, 1776, and because they were celebrating Christmas the day before, so many of them weren't uh, aware of what was going on at the time. So that uh, helped the uh, the Americans in as far as their battle at the Battle of Trenton. But um, a number of, um, I found uh, in, uh, in fact, this is kind of, like I said, what I found just a little while ago, um, the Hessians and also other uh, Germanic uh, troops fought in um, uh, in the battles uh, over the uh, Austrian secession. In fact, they fought on both sides. Uh, there are others that fought in Spain um, the uh, French actually rented some of these Hessian troops as well in, in some of the uh, battles that they fought. So uh, you'll find some of these German, uh, what now German, um, troops that fought in uh, around not only just Europe, but also in North America as well. Kind of interesting, I thought. Using census records, especially if you're looking from about, say, 1850, 1860, and 1870, could give you some information as to where your ancestor comes from uh, or originated. So in other words, uh, for those of you who were just kind of starting out, trying to figure out where to go, or if you have and you just need some confirmation, sometimes if you kind of go through these uh, records, these census records, you can find out. Here's an example of uh, Peter Faust, who came from Darmstadt, uh, Hessian Darmstadt, and his wife, Anna, came from Prussia. Now, it doesn't say what part of Prussia, but I mean, it gives you, you can narrow it down, at, at least at this point. Same thing with Henry Anthus, who was a, a tailor in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and uh, he came from Hessian Darmstadt. And his wife um, came from uh, Prussia. So um, what you'll find in as we get into this a little bit more is that in areas that are now maybe part of Poland, uh, could have been part of, as we mentioned, the Czech Republic in the past and some other locations, they did speak German. And so uh, and then as uh, those battlegrounds kind of change the uh, uh, the lines of uh, the countries, 
then we fought the, we find that even then some of those individuals on the other side still spoke uh, the native language of German. All right, 1900, a lot of times you didn't find quite a, as much good information as you used to find in some of the older census records. In fact, as you can see right here, all it says is, well, it came from Germany. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that's true. They did. Um, the nice, nice thing I like about the 1900 census, though, is that as you look at it, it will give you maybe a little bit more where the um, ancestors' parents came from. And even though this individual was born in Germany, dad came from Holland. All right. So that's a whole different uh, you know, area to research. And then mother came from Germany. So uh, probably the father came down into the, and they may have come from uh, a Western or Northwestern part of Germany uh, when they came over to the U.S. So it's something where you can kind of find some leads uh, in your research. Here's something where the passenger list, and this is the Hamburg passenger list. And I, uh, you can find this in Ancestry.com as well where um, now it actually gives you the town. Now, Ulanau was part of Galicia, which is now part of Southeast Poland. But at that time, it was under dispute between Austria-Hungary and, um, you know, Poland. So you had areas that uh, were in dispute, but they did speak German at that point. So uh, something that you might find uh, kind of interesting. And, and as in this case, it actually told you the village that they came from or the town that they came from. Here's another example where um, using uh, this is the Hamburg list where it actually said where the person was heading for in the top there. It says that they're going to Nebraska or in this case, they're heading to New York. So this kind of gives you some ideas of where you can find um, more information. So not all Germanic ancestors left from Hamburg and on the other side of that coin, too, not all um the people who left from Hamburg were uh, not just Germanic, but uh, they were from other other parts of Europe as well. And the other uh, places where uh, Germanic ancestors would have left would have been Antwerp, would have been Amsterdam. Rotterdam was another location. Later on, Cherbourg was uh, also a, a port where a lot of uh, ancestors left. And in some cases, we'd say Liverpool, England. Well, yeah, what they would do is they would take a, a vessel from wherever, uh, you know, Antwerp maybe, or Hamburg, or Rotterdam, or one of those locations, and then go to Liverpool, and then get a uh, transatlantic vessel that would take them then to the U.S. or Canada, or wherever they're heading. So, <clears throat> again, not all who left from Hamburg were German either. You'll find probably some Eastern Europeans that uh, had left through that port. So, good source to look at when you're looking at records. Naturalization petitions were also really good as well. This one uh, dates back to 1899, and this is uh, uh, Ferdinand Gerlinger, who, well, yeah, okay, he was a native of Germany, doesn't really tell you a lot, but one of the things that you can find in here is that it tells you when he went, came in. So he arrived into the U.S. in the Port of New York in December of 1884. So then at that point, you start looking at some of these items. Now, this is uh, Kessel... Um, uh, uh, Castle Garden's website and Castle Garden doesn't exist anymore. However, the, you can find some of these records by looking at uh, some of the other sites. But here, as we take a look at this, here it tells you he didn't come over in December. So he was a little off by a couple months, but he did come over and the, the ship arrived in the 19th of September in 1884. So there you have uh, when this, and he was heading to Saukville, Wisconsin. So this gives you some more information that you can work with. So you're finding out a lot of uh, information before you even start looking overseas. Um, here's the actual steerage uh, paperwork. And you can see that it says, yes, he was on his way to uh, Sockville and he was 17 years old at the time. So we had a lot of teenagers that were coming over in the late 1800s and early 1900s and uh, ended up starting their life in, in America or in Canada. So, uh, and then eventually making their way into America as well. Here's a, a chance to um, uh, actually see the vessel. Um, you can find this uh, on some of the websites as well. In fact, uh, the Ellis Island website uh, will have some pictures sometimes of the vessels. This is the Rhineland that uh, this gentleman was on. And 
this picture apparently was taken right around 1890. So that was about six years or so after he had uh, been on that particular ship. So uh, looking at um, the Ellis Island website, and um, you can find that uh, the uh, actual uh, frame and the line number, uh, the passenger ID uh, gives you the ship's name, when it arrived. And if you want to buy a copy of that picture, um, you can do that off their website as well. Um, here's the Statue of Liberty. It's now uh, .org, Statue of Liberty .org, and then forward slash Ellis Island and Ellis Dash Island. Uh, you can also look at Steve Morris's website, and he's got uh, a really great uh, way of taking a look at other ports in addition to New York and Castle Garden, as I said, uh, Castle Garden is no longer um, online anymore, but you can find some more information through either the Statue of Liberty site or through Steve Morris. And Steve Morris's site will also let you look at places like Philadelphia or Baltimore or some other locations that maybe your ancestor could have come through. So uh, again, looking at those that index and maybe just calling up the name and seeing what pops up will give you some other information as well. All right, so here's another look at the Hamburg ship list and, and we're going to 1914. So this is just prior to World War I. And uh, we're looking at, uh, again, uh, Ferdinand Gerliger. So we find that, that he, he comes over in 1884 and then he goes back in 1914, uh, apparently to visit his family one last time. And it says Clinton here, and what it's supposed to be is Clintonville. So the person who wrote out this paperwork uh, didn't have the complete name, but you kind of get an idea of uh, when he comes over and uh, who he goes and visits on here. So, all right, you've got some of this information available. Are you ready to cross over to the pond? Well, one of the things you should know is the states, and this is Germany today as we know it. So if your uh, family, say, came from um, Saxony or Hamburg or uh, maybe Berlin or uh, Bavaria, Rhineland, uh, those are areas that are important. That gives you a, an area time frame that you can narrow down, especially if you want to contact some of the um, uh, archives that are available, uh, either the area or federal archives. Also understand the history of what's going on. As I mentioned, uh, the uh, German um, country today, as we know it, uh, only, you know, prior to 1990 was you had West Germany and East Germany. And prior to the, you know, World War II, you had uh, a, a whole different a German empire or, you know, Weimar uh, country that was around at the time. So not understanding what went on might help you understand, A, why your ancestor came over and B, uh, where your ancestor may have migrated from. Why would they have migrated? Well, there are many, you know, obviously there was political unrest and wars. One of the biggest ones would have dated back into the 30 years war from 1618 to 1648. Um, that's where we found the most migration pattern of many of our ancestors, uh, where they may have come from uh, Central and Eastern Europe and ended up moving further to the West or maybe to the North. Uh, you'll find that some of those ancestors uh, were uh, either involved in the war, the um, Holy Roman Empire, which then started to decline in the uh, 18th and 19th century, that had an impact on this as well, which caused a lot of religious persecutions. You had other wars and political unrest, and I mentioned the uh, Austrian concession as well, which was in the eight, uh, 1700s that would have an impact as to why your ancestors may have migrated. And I found it in particular, I lost some of my ancestors' notes and records uh, looking at some of the church records. They're gone in like 1660, 1650. Well, obviously they must have just gotten there around 1650 or so. So they were impacted by probably the afterwards of the, of the 30 years war uh, economic hardships would have played a big part of this as well where they hadn't have had to move because uh, they they needed to survive so those were important factors as to why your ancestors moved out and why they would have migrated on to uh, north america from where they were so uh, again looking at the german history from uh, the Kingdom of Prussia, which was, I mentioned, part of the Holy Roman Empire, and this included Liechtenstein and also parts of Poland. Um, 
the calendar would have changed as well. So when you start looking at the calendar and you say, okay, this would have happened in 17, uh, maybe 95, and you're going, wait a second, this isn't right. And then you note that, that the times and the, uh, the dates were changed. Some of that, especially in the West, was because the French had taken over part of that area. And so they were operating under the French calendar. Um, uh, the Confederation of the Rhine, which was established by Napoleon. And again, you'll see some major changes in, in the Western sections of what is now Germany as a result of, of uh, Napoleon's uh, impact on that section. And that would include the, the Saarland as well and, and all of the Rhine and even parts of uh, uh, you know, the Palat uh, Palatinate area of, uh, of Germany. So what is now Germany today? Um, the German conf uh, Confederation then was uh, kind of put together uh, uh, to kind of fight off some of these uh, um, impacts by the result of like Napoleon. Um, and then you had in 1871, you had what was called the German Empire. So if you remember back when we're looking at uh, U.S. census records, the 1880, 1900 census, it says Germany. Well, that was because at that point in time, that was referred to as the German Empire. So we weren't re referring to them by their provinces or by the kingdoms, we were referring to them by the German Empire. So you'd find, and they'd say, well, where are you from? Well, they were from Germany. Okay, so that really doesn't help you very much like maybe some of the other records would, but uh, you at least you know what's going on at this point in time. As I mentioned, the Weimar Republic was uh, established after World War I and it went in until the early 30s when um, Hitler then took over that part of Germany. And so that had a major impact as with it after World War II as well. So when folks got married in, in Germany, obviously there were uh, reasons why that happened and how that happened. And uh, a lot of times uh, churches and families controlled marriages and even heading into World War I and even past that a little bit as well, uh, you found those scenarios still going on, um, especially by feudal lords. Uh, in fact, sometimes the name would uh, be accustomed to the tied to the uh, the Lord uh, um, property that they were living on at the time. Uh, farm children's uh, marriages were arranged, uh, sometimes by families, sometimes by churches, by states. Um, and so we can go on and also um, you go on to whether they were Catholic or whether they were Protestant, and that made a big difference as well. Uh, name changes, and this is just an example. I'm, I'm just going through just a few. I mean, there's hundreds of them, and and when I talked to Schmidt, um, I've seen like a dozen different variations, especially when they came over here and how those names would, would change. And this was another good example of that. Gerlinger, we've mentioned Gerlinger here a couple of times already and how that changed. Han was another good example. And Beshta in, Bo in Bohemia, it was spelled B-E-S-T-A. And when it came over here, it got changed then to, uh, to Beshta. So you can see that, that that's gonna play into your research as well. All right, so things to note in your German research, uh, we go to uh, when uh, the um, German diaspora occurred in the 18th century, and there was one area that uh, left 80,000 to over 100,000 Germans uh, went to America. And as we mentioned, even in some cases, they, uh, they fought in, in, uh, in the American Revolution. Uh, most came from Southwest Germany and that, that particular region. Uh, peasants were required to ask uh, and pay large fees. In some cases, they left anyway. And also, uh, as we mentioned, uh, some of the sites that some of them left from, we mentioned Antwerp and Rotterdam. Uh, immigrant families were sometimes on different ships. And in, in many cases, you had to apply to leave. So if you wanted to leave from your, uh, wherever you were heading out of uh, the town or village, you had to go to the police station and then say, yes, I'm leaving this area and then head over towards the port that you were leaving from. So that happened quite a bit as well. Okay, let's take a look at some of the religious records here. Um, we're gonna be uh, looking at uh, um, religion the various religions that made up um, uh, Germanic culture, put it that way. Um, the Evangelical Church of Germany, 
the United Press, uh, Protestant, what became uh, later became uh, the Lutheran or Calvinist Reformed Church. Uh, obviously, the Catholic Church was a, a major impact of, of the uh, German society, as well as uh, Judaism and uh, the Baptist Huguenots, Moravian. Um, Catholic religion was established uh, as far as the records in the 16th century. Uh, the Peace of Augsburg or the Treaty of Augsburg uh, also in 1555, allowed the recognition of Lutheran records. So you start seeing Protestant records showing up uh, after 1555 or so. So in some cases, you'll find maybe some Protestant records a little earlier than some Catholic records in some of these little areas and villages. Um, the earliest uh, religious records date back, as I mentioned, to the 16th century. Uh, it started out in some cases with Protestant records, but then we went into Catholic records. Um, most Catholic parishes, and this is one from Walsdorf, which is um, in the Rhine, uh, just south of uh, Down Eiffel, and the um, uh, those parish records would contain the baptism. In some cases, it might actually have the the date of birth, uh, marriage records, and in some cases, then you you may find a, a listing of burial records. And they become more complete as you head further into uh, the later years. Here's a a good example of a record from 1842. This is the baptism of Nicholas Etten. Um, what you notice is that it's all written in Latin. So all Catholic records you're going to find are in Latin. Some parishes will contain communion and confirmation information. And as we, as we kind of zoom in here a little bit, uh, it's talking about how he was a legitimate uh, child uh, Johannes Peter Etten, and he was a farmer, and Anna uh, Catherine Zender, and they both lived in the village of Walsdorf. And it talks about the uh, sponsors, as we would call them today, uh, Nicholas Etten and, and Christina uh, Schlau, uh, and they also lived in Walsdorf. So um, your, your German might not help you, but your Latin will. How's that? Uh, so it is when it comes to Catholic records. Uh, here you go back further, and this dates back to 1714. And this is kind of, uh, uh, I know in this particular church, uh, those records do date back into about 1700, late 1600. So again, this is the Western portion of what is now Germany. So uh, St. Nicholas Church, and this is the marriage of Nicholas Neuler and Catherine Annen. Uh, it doesn't give much beyond that, but it does give the date of when they, and if you notice, it goes, um, especially when you're looking at the calendar, this is, it's like nine B-R-I-S. So it's the ninth month, even though it wasn't, um, it, it, that calendar, they didn't have all 12 months. So you, you have to understand that too, that you're looking at uh, um, the 21st of, of November, essentially is what we're looking at. Um, here's a record that dates back to uh, 1700, and this is the baptism of uh, Johann Abel, but it's spelled J-E-A-N. So you see a little bit of French in here as well, um, As uh, and this is from a village of uh, Wurzweiler, and again, 24th of January in, in 1700. So um, it does provide you with some information, but uh, not as much as what we see a little later on in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And this is um, Protestant records where most of the Protestant records are in German. Um, in fact, almost all of them are in German. Usually you'll find birth, you'll find marriage, uh, burial records, vestry minutes. And I find that vestry minutes, when you're looking at Protestant records, can be very important because it may actually tell you when your ancestor left that village so uh and, and or uh when uh, that person may have arrived into that village as well so uh, vestry minutes can be very important when you're looking at protestant records uh communion and confirmation information this is the marriage of christian wilhelm anthus and anna maria schmidt um and they were from zwingenberg which is in hessian darmstadt so just south of, of the Z city of darmstadt um, and again, this is kind of German script. So it kind of, uh, if you're not used to looking at that, it's sometimes getting uh, like a, a hand script uh, or a copy of the of something like a German hand script 
uh, you can it would help you be able to find uh, what some of these letters mean. So uh, here, if you notice on Schmidt, it looked like it was a V. So as we look at uh, a little bit of this, that V is actually an S. Okay. Same thing when we look at uh, say an H, looks like an F as we would look at it. But if you look up a little bit, you notice that the F up uh, at the top of the page here is is a little different than what they would look as when they were writing an H. So understanding and knowing that is is a, a good way of being able to move ahead in your research. Most records are going to be in German, as I mentioned, civil records. Um, uh, Johann Peter Etten and Anna Maria Zender are married in 1830. So as we go down, uh, you can find some of these records. Um, depends upon how good the copy is, too, when you go to translate it using some of the translation. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. But um, Johann Peter Etten, and um, it goes into a little bit more detail, and it talks a little bit about Anna Catherine Zender, and, and also got, lists her parents' name at the bottom there. So you get a little bit more of an idea of uh, where they're from. Now, I'm trying to translate this using uh, the Google uh, translator and it did pick up a little bit, but if you notice again, depending upon how the copy is, but it can kind of give you some idea of where, what this you know ancestor uh, came from or what his parents' names were. And uh, you can get a little bit of an idea um, of, what, uh, of what you're looking at. Uh, here's an idea again of using Google Chrome of the browser translation program. And as I mentioned, I use Firefox, uh, there's Safari, um, Edge, uh, Internet Explorer, and uh, even in some of the older versions might be able to help you by being able to translate that letter. Or if you wanna go back to the old days, uh, you can go back to the uh, German English Genealogical Dictionary. And I still have my copy right over there in my bookshelf. So I, I use it every so often if I need to, but, um, uh, this will help you in your research as well. And as I mentioned, not all records were in German. This is a case where in the western half of Germany, when Napoleon had taken over that section, some of these records were in French. So you'll find uh, this is the birth of uh, Anna Catherine Zender back in 1805. So again, uh, it's in some cases, it's all written down in French. All right, now well, when we look at um, some church records we can find some of those on this is a paid site archeon.de and they do have an english version of it so if you go on to it and you just call up uh, uh, archion.de you'll probably get the german section but up in the upper right hand corner you can find the english version of it as well so that will help you um uh here's a just looking at the english version i, I called up a, a location and I said, okay, I want to see what's digitally available. And it it didn't give me anything at that point in time. But, you know, it's, sometimes it's a little bit of a hunt and peck. What I also like, besides that site, is Matricula. Um, and that is uh, not only German records, but even areas outside of Germany. So if your ancestor liked that one that we saw a little while ago where the, the father came from Holland, you might be able to find some records off of that as well through this website. This is another one where they have they do have an English version to it. So this is a map of the records. And this I think I uh, screen saved this about um, a couple weeks ago. So you can kind of see the different parishes, the number of parishes they have. So we're not just looking at uh, Germany. We're looking at some sections of Western Poland where they probably spoke some German, um, Austria, parts of Switzerland. Uh, looks like Belgium, there's some areas in there, Liechtenstein, uh, and the Netherlands. So this will help you if your ancestors did migrate from another section, you might be able to find some of the records there as well. So here's a kind of an example of the different parishes in this. I kind of zoomed in and kind of picked up one particular area here. And so I, all right, I'm going to pinpoint this area and say okay this is i picked the time frame that i want to work with 1500 to 2000 and so uh we go from there down to what the six hits that i had and then what records what parishes that are available so what i did was i picked the 
uh, St. Marius uh, in Urbach. And um, it actually gives the records there on the bottom. So they're not indexed, but you can find, you can go from say 1818, in this case to 1836. And if you had an ancestor, maybe that was born in 1830, that might be able to be able to find that birth certificate on that record. Okay, so this is kind of what it would look like if you were to get into uh, that particular uh, record and it will zoom in and talk a little bit about this is a little not too um, sharp to see, but uh, uh, page is a little bit dull. I apologize for that, but it kind of gives you an idea of the parents and then who was representing the parents. Um, here's one that's the if you want to get into the um, um, federal archives, they also have an English version. So that's kind of nice. The, the German version, if you get into the regional archives, as you'll see in a minute, uh, they're going to be mostly all in German. But you can kind of translate that using your a translator on your browser as well. So this is bundesarchive.de. And um, this gives you uh, a link to what they refer to as the archive portal. D, and you can see the state archives there, uh, local archives, church archives. And so what I did was I just picked one, and uh, one was the Bitsum um, uh, Archive of Trier. And um, it, would, uh, it kind of goes in a little bit of, uh, again, this is all in German, but uh, it goes in a little bit of detail here. You can translate some of this by using your browser. And so I did that and it came up with the Roman Catholic Archive of Trier. So uh, it gives you a little bit of uh, details. And if you plan on going to visit that area, it gives you the opening times that they're available. So uh, it will also allow you then to find the individual parish. So you might be have a chance, you may have to do this the old way, maybe email the parish and say, hey, do you happen to have a record that dates back to whatever date you're looking at. So that's some more information that you can work with. Um, here's one for the Austrian National Archives. And uh, that one, um, as you can see, is going to be, uh, they do have an English version of that. And as we go and uh, go to now to the Bohemian, there's also one for the Swiss Archives, and that one has an English version as well. The Bohemian Church Records, um, is on a site that's called portafontium.eu. Um, they you can translate the pages on this, uh, and you can see that uh, the religions are, and it's not just Catholic religion, uh, and evangelical, um, the uh, Greek Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, and there's even some civil records that are available as well, including uh, uh, during World War II. So here's um. Uh, an example of uh, a church record of uh, Dorothea Halla from 1749 in the village of Ostra. And um, I'm going to, my, my check is probably worse than my German here, so I'm going to give it a, a good go here. I'm going to say it's Hornet, Hornet Sekarani, and I've used that. I tried to translate it a couple times, so I think I had that right. So, But it dates back to 1749, so you can get, and their records there do date back into the uh, 17th century and even in some cases the 16th century. So you can go back quite a ways with some of these records. Okay, here's a few stories that I found um, either researching for individuals or in my own family's case. So... Um, and when you know when you research, you have to be open minded because you just never know what you're going to find when you go into this research. So um, the first example is we're looking at the passenger list from 1895 and we're looking at the father, Hirsch, um, the mother, Rebecca, and there's children. But they also has another family member. Her name was Sarah. And uh, she was 32 years old. And um, it uh, uh, definitely mentions her. Now, uh, you can see that uh, it, it she's uh, in the first one, appearance, and then after. Uh, now, we look at the New York passenger list, same ship as it comes aboard, goes across the Atlantic, comes to the U.S., and now we're finding that 
Sarah is now hers. Well, in finding out what happened here, and I looked in a little bit more about this and found out from some of the family members too that uh, um, her set of disability and the mother did not, the mother of the, of the family did not want to leave him behind. So apparently they put him in a dress and didn't think the captain would uh, allow him if he was, you know, they realized what his situation was. So they uh, brought him to uh, Illinois and he, uh, uh, after the mother died in 1915, um, he was put into uh, um, a hospital in uh, near Rock Island, Illinois. And uh, so kind of a sad story, but it was an interesting story because that was certainly one I didn't expect to see. All right. So if we take a look at another one. Here's a letter from the archive in Tilson where I had written. Um, and I found that uh, in writing to, to get some information on a particular person, um, it gave me the fact that um, Dorothea Gibbets had died at the age of uh, uh, 38 years old. And I thought that was interesting. So I went from the civil record and then went to the, the looked at the Catholic record on Portofantium and found the burial record of Dorothea Gibbets. And it was uh, kind of hard to read, but I was able to make out some, some of the information here. It says in the year 1763, they're from the village of Nerzan, which is a little village in the, in the Western Bohemia. Uh, the family mother, Dorothea, wife of Johannes Gibbets, the surviving widow, peasants from the village of Nerzan. Her soul is with the almighty God and her Catholic body is buried at 38 years old. So that pretty much confirmed what the civil records were showing. So what happened in this situation? Well, I find a few days later that the son, who was uh, uh, only uh, like 16 days old or so, he dies on the 14th day of the month of April in 1763. His name is Wenceslaus. And uh, Johannes Gibbets, and he talks about the parents, and, and he's a peasant from the village of Nerzan, and together in with the home of the mother's soul. So it's confirming that the mother had passed away, whose soul and body is returned on day 16 in a Catholic ceremony. All right. Then we find, just a few days later, Another child, his name is Albertus Gibbets. So we find that he passed away. And again, he is the, they talk about the, the mother's soul and, and the son of Johannes Gibbets. So this obviously has my attention as to what's going on. I find the baptismal records, they're baptized that almost that same day as they were born. So obviously this was... You know, things didn't go very well with this. And um, the 31st day of the month of March, and they baptized Albertus, the son of Johannes Gibbets, peasants from the village of Nerzan, and also um, Wenceslaus. So uh, this is really, uh, um, you know, a sad situation. So they kind of put everything together here. Um, Wenceslaus and Albertus Gibbets are born and... Uh, on 31st of March, 1763, and they're baptized on the same day. Uh, Dorothea Gibbets dies uh, on the 1st of April, so she dies the next day. She's 38 years old. Uh, and uh, it's Ver Verpenice, I believe is how they pronounce that, the parish. Wenceslaus dies on the 14th. He's 15 days old. And Albertus dies on 18th of April, and he's 19 days old. So you can imagine what this family and, and the whole village, the whole village knew, but what you're finding in these records and how uh, emotional this would have been for some of these people back then. So uh, sometimes you realize that genealogy is more than just uh, dates and numbers and names. Sometimes you're getting a feel for what actually is going on uh, with this family in particular and in this village and at that time. So, uh, genealogy can be really interesting stuff when you really get down to it. All right, so handy information that you can work with, Family Tree, a German genealogy guide. Um, you can trace your German roots online. That's another good site. Um, I've used this one. This is an older version, Germanic genealogy, a guide to worldwide sources and migration patterns. Uh, this is the third edition. I think there's a couple more out there since then. 
And then also, um, if you have a subscription to Family Tree Magazine uh, or you're able to get access to it, the September-October edition talks about finding your German ancestors. And we kind of goes over a little bit about what we even talked about today. So this gives you a little bit more information to work with and um, some places where you might be able to try finding. So other locations, germanroots.com. Facebook has also a, a group, a German genealogy page, and there's also Black Sea German Research, which is called blackcgr.org. And uh, you can kind of go through uh, and find some records there as well. I'll leave that open here for a second so that you can find um, some information here. Okay. Um, Okay, let's see if I can go through. All right, well, I'll tell you what, I'll just start from here and go from there. How's that? Well, this is perfect timing, so it was pretty close to the end anyway. Um, one of the things I was going to mention is you never know what to expect in, in your genealogy research. And understand that your research isn't something you're going to find overnight. You know, I know we, we like to think that we can kind of do it pretty quickly, but your research is something that will take years sometimes to find. And, and uh, as you can see in my research and I was doing for other people, I've started in early 1980s and I've been still looking for things. So um, some questions that we have here, and I'm just look, noticing a couple of questions here. How long did a German immigrant stay in the port of departure before finding a ship to get on? It depends. Um, in, in some cases, like in, in England, um, they could stay there for a couple months before they got on board a ship. In some cases, if they were able to get uh, access to a ship quickly, uh, it may not take them very long. It depends upon, A, if they had money, if they were supported by another, uh, or they may have been supported by a family member. So that might have played an important part as to what uh, information and uh, whether they would be able to get on a ship right away or not. So that would be another important part. Um, okay, well, here's a good question. How can you find help, uh, ask for research help from the Germany archives? If you get on that site, there is a contact uh, list and you can kind of go down and, and now you may have to translate your letter. You may have to go put it in German. So good access, be able to use your translation program on your browser and be able to use that and see if that, uh, and then be able to send that off. And the nice thing about this is that you can email it to them too. So um, you can kind of get a response back pretty quickly. Now I've sent the letter to an archive now and I've uh, emailed it to them. Uh, in fact, I even sent it in English and in some cases they're fine with it. They'll send you an, a response back in English. But uh, if you can, I had a cousin who was, I'll, I'll, I'll add this one real quickly. I had a cousin that was, um, going through a train station and he asked and he said i it was the worst german i could come up with and he asked what track this train was leaving on the conductor said you know in german track four and you can just catch the train right there and he goes danka and as he walks away and the conductor turns around and says that wasn't so bad now was it so maybe writing it in german even though it may not be the best german that you can write they would appreciate that. So they might, uh, you know, give you a, uh, maybe take a little extra step to, to do that. So something for you uh, to keep in mind, but if you get on that website, you'll find that contact page and that you can ch check with them as well. All right. Um, I see there's another one here, uh, half hour free research. I'd have to see what that's. Yeah, so it looks like she was asking how often you can re ask for research help. And um, the archive that she had specifically contacted told them um, that they could do a half hour of free research, but didn't clar clarify how they keep track of your requests and frequency. So you have any experience of, you know, those limits and how um, to ask for additional help if you kind of um, go over that half hour? I think it depends on the archive, too. If you were going through, like, um, the one of those church archives, that might... Um, I don't know if they, I, I've, I've used them once. I've actually sent an email once and, uh, it took a while to get back to them, but, uh, I did get a response back, but 
in some cases, if it's a federal archive um, and you're just, or maybe a regional archive, in some cases, like in Koblenz, I got a response back, like I was saying right away. So I, I had no problem with that, but that was a few years back. Um, I would say if you're going to send them an email, you'll probably get a response back pretty quickly if you send them an email. So, uh, and then, like I said, there's a contact list that link at the bottom of some of these pages and you can go into the contact link and, and go through that. And usually somebody's there to kind of like the archives here, you'll get a response back. It might take a day or two, but you'll get a response back from them. Yeah, and another thing to point out is you might want to, you know, maybe hire a researcher in that area who's going to be familiar with those records, especially right. if you have a lot yes. of research in that mm -hmm. area that you kind of go over the amount that that archive is allowed to help you. Um, that exactly. might be an option too. Give you some explanation. The the other thing too is um, there used to be, I don't know if you could still do this today, but uh, there was the international money order. I think you can still do that today. Um and if you're writing to that particular parish, you know, throw in 10 euro and, you know, and, and, and just say, can you help me out with this? And a lot of times they will get back to you pretty quickly. I've done that with a, a couple of German parishes and they've been very nice in sending me a response back. It, uh, now this is back in the days when you had to send a letter back and forth, but and a lot of times then you can send an email. And if, if you get a response back very quickly, you know, send them a nice donation and you'll get a, you know, sometimes a nice thank you back too. So I would do that. Um, let's see. Antwerp to Philadelphia. Yes. Yes, I know what you mean. I had, uh, uh, okay, the question was about uh, part of Germany at the time, but it's now part of Poland. So do you, I, do you go through Polish or German websites? I've used both. Um, uh, you check the closest regional archive that you can, which would have been in uh, probably in the north of Germany. And then um, uh, you can check the Polish websites as well. And I've used... Uh, Excuse me. Uh, there was um, there. I'm trying to think offhand here. There was a there. I've used a Polish. Um, there's a Polish church site too, and a, I offhand I can't think of the name of it as I'm thinking here. But um, there's also regional archives in Western Poland that you can find. So as far as you know, as we mentioned through this whole thing, the borders varied a lot uh, through the centuries. So. Um, if you start with the German site, if you can't get the information, then check the Polish uh, archive and see, and then check some of the church archives. Uh, the uh, Poland also has some church archives, so you can also search some of the records there. And I'm putting a Polish um, site in that I know about um, Genetikia. I I don't I never pronounce them right. So, um, but here is the link in the chat for that. Um, and somebody did ask too if we could do a Polish session in the future. So we don't have any one, one planned in 2024, but I will definitely put it on the list for 2025. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, German Quakers and also uh, Baptist Huguenots, um, there are uh, there are some sites out there. I didn't. I don't think I've had them listed on the handouts, but uh, there's uh, there's also a Quaker site here in the U.S. and you can find some information off of that and be able to that might be able to trace you back into uh, some of the German records as well. Um, I would go through civil records and then look at the Protestant records and see if you can find uh, as far as looking at religious records and see if you can find because in a lot of cases, sometimes, and this is true in some of the other countries where the records they didn't have, especially with the Baptists, they would only be in, in the, the standard church state record, so the state church, uh, a state religion, so to speak, and then you might be able to find some records there as well. And I always recommend starting with the Family Search Wiki. If you're, you know, searching in an unfamiliar area or a certain record set, that, that's yes. always the number one place I start. Um, you can type in, you know, a certain area in Germany and learn about that area, learn about what resources are there. It has direct links to anything that's digitized on there, not even just the stuff that's on Family Search. So that would be a great spot to start for anyone who's looking for specific resources. Mm -hmm. 
And um, you, know, you mentioned uh, there was uh, Moravian uh, records too. Um, many of those migrated to places like England and Ireland, um, and then they uh, moved on to North America. So you might find some records in England and you might find some records in France uh, as well as Germany. So as you progress, you may look at some of the records, especially in 1800s in, in England and see if you can find them before they migrated off to North America. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, Schwitkowski. Wow. Main's name of Hennig. Yeah, you're probably right. The question was, I don't know if they it did so illegally. How would I check? You might check the passenger list, see if it's listed on the passenger list, and then kind of go from there. And then uh, check the church records, see how they're listed. If they were, especially if they were evangelical or they were Lutheran or uh, some kind of Protestant religion, check the vestry minutes. Vestry minutes may say um, this individual is coming in as so-and-so, and they might be able to tell you that their name used to be this, and now they're, you know, at the present name. So yeah. um, vestry minutes are really, I've always used vestry minutes in Protestant records because they, they'll give you a lot of background that you probably wouldn't get otherwise. And this person saying, you know, their family changed their names during World War One. Well, think about what was going on in the world in World War One. You know, they didn't right. want to have a very German sounding name. So, yes, you know, exactly. they might not have gone through the legal process of changing mm -hmm. that name because they didn't want, um, you to know, that identified. record there. Right. So. And the passenger list might be able to tell you that, especially if you check the declaration of intent in the U.S. and see how they're listed in that name as well. Could you go back to um, that first Hessian website? Someone's asking um, so that they could write it down. Uh, uh, we all are also recording, oh, so. Um, okay. Um, we can always I'm look back at the recording for that as out well. Of, uh, hmm. It won't let me. Oh, there we go. Okay. Where I'm mentioning the, the, the different battles. Um, here, this one. Uh, was the American Battle Trust. Uh, it's called battlefields.org. And then uh, this other one is uh, the Mount Vernon.org. And that has an article about the uh, Hessian troops when they were fighting in the American Revolution. And then also uh, the interesting article uh, by this gentleman who was a professor at, I think it's the University of Florida. And um, it, he talks about how uh, a number of uh, not just Hessian troops, they weren't just all Hessian, they were in from other provinces as well, but uh, they um, were in several battles in France, the French hired them to fight in some battles in Canada and also in Spain, and as I mentioned, the um, uh, Austrian concession, uh, the battles that occurred with that, uh, the Holy Roman Empire, you can go back earlier, a uh, number of Hessian troops, I guess the Hessian troops apparently were very good and very loyal troops uh and, but they lived a very difficult uh life in in there as uh as soldiers so uh it was a very interesting article that you'll find on this one from mountvernon.org we had some other questions in the chat earlier that i want to make sure we get answered um so someone okay. said i have a grandfather from greater germany um that's now part of poland one office confirmed his baptism there, but I have to pay approximately $15 for the record. The office says that I cannot um, pay by credit card. So how do I pay and how can I get this record? What, how, what experience goes, do you have of purchasing international records? I've used um, uh, international money order. And I would make sure before you do that, um, email them again and say, okay, what specifically would you like? And and how would you like me to, you know, credit card, obviously. And I find this in Europe, too. Sometimes they don't take American credit cards. I didn't know there was a difference, but apparently there is. So um, in some cases, they can't accept an American credit card. Uh, they can only accept a European credit So check to see specifically what they're looking for. If they'll take an international money order, then you can go to, a, I think, a bank. And um, I don't think the post office to do that anymore. But you can go to a bank, get an international money order for the amount that they're looking for. And keep in mind that that's going to be in euro, in German, and not in dollars. So if they're looking for a 15, 
make sure it's 15 uh, euro and not $15. All right, and then from there, then you can uh, be able to uh, uh, get that, probably that record you're looking for. But yeah, that's, that's a problem. I ran across that a few times in Europe as well. If you're going over there, keep in mind that sometimes uh, they won't accept an American credit card, even though it's a Visa card and it's supposed to be accepted worldwide. In some cases, they won't take it. Yeah. So I guess um, this is one of them. And someone asked, is PayPal an option to get a record? Yes. I have personally paid yes. um, yeah. people in mm -hmm. Germany with PayPal as well. Of course, mm -hmm. there is, you know, that translate or... Um, they will translate for you, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they and Venmo is another one. And, and yeah, there do that conversion. Um, so you might have to pay a little bit more, of course, because you know that's right. how it is. And but right now the euro is like a buck ten on the dollar. So just to kind of give you an idea, uh, what you're looking at, I think when I was there a couple months ago, it was like a buck. It was about a buck twelve. So it's gone down a little bit. So it's um, a little easier to. Um, to deal with but uh, uh one thing if you're going over there when you see that the euro price is closer to the dollar buy it at that point and then because if it goes up you're making you know you're doing well um so i you know just a little word of advice been there and done that so well, someone asked Anybody earlier else? as well about um the hamburg passenger list and what the year is included so um i found a link uh, to the family search wiki that I just put in the chat for you um, that talks about the different kind of time periods and how to um, find them online with links on there. So it looks like, you know, there's some um, from 1850 to 1934, um, mm -hmm. obviously not full coverage of it, um, but see that link that I posted in the chat for you. And then, the, um, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to uh, uh, family, uh, Ancestry has a number of Hamburg but I believe my heritage also, and I haven't mentioned them at all, but uh, my heritage also has some passenger lists on their website. So, but these are, keep in mind, these are subscription sites. So you need to be able to pay ahead of time. Uh, in some cases you can pay for like three months or six months. Uh, another site to look at, especially if you're looking at ancestors who may have lived in New England, AmericanAncestors.org is another good site to check. But again, that's a subscription site again. So um, if you uh, can get a subscription for like three months or six months, uh, then that's a good way to go and then find the information you need right away. Our next question, um, someone was saying that they have, you know, some documents like a passenger list and um, naturalization papers that say Mecklenburg, but there's no village listed. So how would you go about trying to find a village? One suggestion I had was, you know, searching the siblings, searching the children, searching U.S. church records. Um, but what other suggestions do you have for trying to uncover that hometown in Germany? I, I sometimes use family search and see if I can, uh, in their wiki, and use if I can get down to um, a, a, a narrow. Also, um, and I haven't mention this at all but uh google earth uh is a good site to use as well where you can actually get down and and i'll get down to almost not quite street level but enough and kind of cruise around and see if i can find the village if i have an idea that i know in you know in this case in mecklenburg where they may have come from uh then i might kind of it may take you a few minutes, but if you're going to really kind of get down to, I found some villages uh, when you kind of zoom in enough that you can't find when you're kind of zoomed out. So uh, look through that too. But uh, some of the wikis are good because that will kind of let you give you some ideas, and and they may give you a link too for the local the local uh, city archive possibly. Uh, in the nearest town that where this area might have been or the regional archive where you may be able to find some information. Yeah, and someone um, said in the chat there was actually also a village of Mecklenburg. So maybe that is yes. the village and not necessarily mm -hmm. in that, uh, the region. Yeah, area, the mm -hmm. region, yeah. So. right, exactly. Um, someone's wondering about census records in Germany. So what experience do you have with German census records and where um, do you find them? Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't done too much with census records. I know you and I, you can find them on one of the paid sites. Um, I take it back. I have looked at a few of them, but it's been mostly on like, uh, I think it's Ancestry where you can find some of those that um, 
the census records are um, are they're not quite as consistent as what we find here in the U.S. or Canada or um, um, I'm trying to think of you know even like England where you'd have it every ten years. Some of them were were a little bit um, uh, kind of. Uh, and I'm trying to think of the word and depending upon the area that you're talking about too. So it may vary by year and, uh, and it might vary by, by religion too. So I, I haven't, uh, I've been in it a few times, but I haven't really, I think there's other records you can find besides the census. If you're looking, if you really want to detail your record, I guess that's a good way to go um, in Europe. But I, I just personally, I haven't looked in that direction that much put um, the link to the family search wiki on German census records. So I personally haven't um, done, the, done them either. They're not really um, available in the late 1700s, early 1800s. So right. yeah. um, for me, for my ancestors, they're no help for me. So Yeah. Um, and definitely. like I said, they're not very consistent and it depends upon the area you're talking about. So uh, if you're looking at uh, maybe uh, Bohemia, I don't even think, well, they did have a census record. Um, it was, but like you said too, it was like early 1800s. So if you're trying to get back below that, that's not really going to do you that much good. There's a question um, earlier about um, someone saying they have um, family from uh, Wurttemberg who settled in Illinois and possibly was in Indiana before that, but they're having difficulty finding naturalization records. So. Um, anyone have any suggestions for those researching in Illinois and Indiana for naturalization records? I personally haven't dealt with those. Again, I would recommend starting with that family search wiki um, if you're specifically looking for naturalization records. Also, keep in mind they might not have gotten naturalized. You know that wasn't a requirement. So right, and if they yeah. lived 1900, um, of course they may not have been very honest either on and the census record. But if it would indicate if it says AL. They were not naturalized. If it says NA, they were naturalized. So if they if it does say NA, then I would look at some of the Illinois the counties prior to say what was it 1922. Uh, most of the uh, naturalizations were conducted by local courts. So uh, if you knew that they came from Fulton County, Illinois, then you want to check Fulton counties and to see if those immigration records or the naturalization records do exist. And keep in and mind, even it, on the, the census, they could have lied to the census taker. There, you know, the census taker is not, hey, show me your proof of citizenship or show me that you filed your your declaration of intent. So, you know, the other thing be a possibility too. <laughs> yeah, the other thing too is check the national archives uh, in Chicago, and even though that it, the archives index might only include maybe Cook County, it would include all of Indiana and Illinois, they do have records and the archives uh, might be able to provide you with some uh, background as far as uh, the intent to naturalize, which is usually the first thing you filled out and then the actual naturalization record. So the, the intent to naturalize might even provide you with more information. So if they, um, if they were uh, say in the late 1800s or something like that, and you know what county they were in, Check the county. Check the county library to see if they may have that information on microfilm. Um, also, and as I mentioned, check the national archives to see if they might have that information available as well. And that's the national archives in Chicago, and that covers all of the Midwest. And um, our question: There's one that says, "My German and Swiss ancestors left from the port, port of Rotterdam for Charleston, South Carolina, in 1752." Are there any Rotterdam records that I could research for that time period that might help me determine where my German ancestor came from? That's a tough time period, 17, yeah. 1752. Um, if they came over directly here, there would be, depending upon the port that they came in on, you might be able to find some records in uh, New England records, especially. Uh, and I'm thinking probably like... Um, or they may have even come through St. John. Uh, so check some of the Canadian records to see if uh, the Canadian port records, and they have their records date back, I don't know if they date back in the 1700s, but they date back quite a bit, uh, quite a distance. Back. And then um, New York, and, and keep in mind, you know, Castle Garden only started in 1855. So prior to that, there wasn't really any, any official port where, you know, people had to register to come in. 
Um, so they had the passenger list. And so some of those was kind of, uh, especially like in places like Philadelphia and uh, New York and, and Boston. So if they did come in through there, uh, now the, if I remember correctly, um, Mass state of Massachusetts has a pretty complete um, listing of, of passenger lists, I believe. And if you check their website, if they came in through New England, uh, check to see if they may have come in that way. And I'm, I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head here of different ideas, but uh, those probably would be places. I would be more apt to check here in the U.S. to see if uh, what records you could find, because there's probably more of a chance to finding them there than you would find them uh, over there. And like you said, uh, Katie, that, you know, in the 1700s, uh, you know, they they may have had a list of passengers, but um, that would probably be. Search records are probably your best bet to try, you know, searching both in the United States yes. and, um, you know, exactly. Rotterdam. But yeah, obviously exactly. that's a big area. Um, but I think that that might be your best bet. Also, don't forget to check those siblings or those children, you know, that though that could be the key to you know what that that ancestral hometown was and where specifically they were they came from. Family um, Bibles are often pretty, you know, and I mentioned um, county histories too. Um, if you know the county that they were in, and there was a person, especially the person who was looking for that immigration record, um, the county history. Uh, if, if your ancestors listed in the county history, they may tell you when they immigrated. It may give you the date of immigration and when that person may have nat naturalized as well, because sometimes depending upon how popular that person was, or even if they were a pioneer of that, that area, uh, they may have a lot of information on there. So those are a couple of resources to check as well. And then um, she said records in South Carolina say the Germans on the ship were from Wurttemberg was, but was there a Wurttemberg in that time period, 752? you know i i think so and um i was just looking um and someone also said the dutch kept excellent records if they left from rotterdam it's a good chance they have the manifest in the netherlands um and yes. they said i've had success finding records on the dutch and uh, um for immigration records so that's something maybe to follow up on um, look in the dark, Dutch archives that would be available possibly. Dutch records are good. Um, and that's a good a good point to bring up is uh, that you'll be able to find some records. Um, again, whether they existed, I think we were looking, we we're talking about something in the 1700s. Um, they may or may not. I haven't looked in, I have looked in some Dutch records recently, but not, not in that part. So, um, okay. Wurttemberg, according to this, is um, the main town of Wurttemberg is uh, the region is Stuttgart. So um, if you can find Stuttgart on your map, uh, that area is is where uh, the I think uh, Wurttemberg was a province, though, if I remember correctly. And I'm just looking to see what else this says here as we're talking um it's yeah it's a cultural and linguistic uh, linguistic in linguistic region um uh, baden and hohenzollern two historical territories Württemberg now forms the federal state of baden Württemberg. so A couple of people have been asking about the chat too and the recording. I will send out a recording link and a link to the chat since there were lots of helpful resources put into the chat or send that out in an email to everyone on Monday. Okay, I'm, I'm still looking up this part on, and I was kind of interested in finding out myself on this part. Yeah, so uh, Wurttemberg, uh, it's south of Hessian and west of uh, Bayern. And Baden, so it's uh, Baden-Württemberg is what it's referred to as. Yes, try I'm to search in that area and see what you yeah. can find, and good luck. <laughs> good luck. Um, someone's saying, I have a record of an ancestor coming to Maine. She thinks possibly Portland. Might there be a reason that that ship landed there instead of New York? Well, I mean, ships could come in. There's lots of ports 
all throughout the United States. Um, it might just be that specific ship line. Maybe there was a storm that they decided to go further north instead of landing in New York. I mean. And keep in mind, too, that they, you getting on a ship in the 1700s and early 1800s wasn't the easiest thing on the planet. So to get there, you wanted to go quickly. And a lot of people would go right to St. John in Canada, or they would go to a port in, in Maine uh, because it was faster. Mm -hmm. And and then they would get on another ship maybe to go to New York. So uh, that's why. depends on where they're coming from, too. Right. If there was disease on board the ship, you're trying to avoid all that, plus a disaster. And you mentioned weather. There were all kinds of reasons why uh, you wanted to go as fast as you can to get across the Atlantic. And depending on the time period, you know, maybe New York was super busy at that time. I mean, New York yeah. saw how many millions and millions of people at certain times. So maybe your ancestor was smart and like, I, I want to avoid all the crowds. Let me get on a ship that's going to, to land in Maine instead. That's, you know, less congested. <laughs> and it and it, you know, again, it depended upon the time of the year. And it also depended upon when the time frame we're talking about, too. Yeah. So and. We didn't have radar back then, so we didn't see storms coming like we do today. That's a lot longer of a trek than it is now. <laughs> it was, and it was not fun. You know, I um, there's uh, I've been on board some of those uh, immigrant ships, uh, uh, copies, you know, version of them, and a lot of times they had the windows closed, and you sat there in the dark, or if you could get light a lamp, and that's where it was. And if you didn't, if you weren't good with waves, then you didn't enjoy the trip very much, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, someone's wondering about um, ancestors who sailed from Bremen. Obviously, a lot of those records um, might not still exist. Um, what other options do they have for trying to track their ancestor who they believed um, sailed from Bremen or they know sailed from Bremen? They're specifically looking for what the original village or hometown was, and um, of course, you know, some of the U.S.-based records that they found have not specifically identified that village or hometown. Well, then uh, I, I think if you're, depending upon what subscription site you have, uh, you can look up some of those European records on some of those subscriptions. And you may have to do, check a couple of them uh, and then look at some of the European archive sites. Just check some of the church records. Um, uh, you know, if you can get, uh, get an identify a name uh, surname at a particular area and they may have been uh, unique to that one particular parish that might be a, a good way to kind of narrow down your your lead if you have an idea of the area and you know check with the archives in that particular region and see if they have a record of of that you know again you might have to send an email out and 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 get an idea of what uh, what may be going, you know, what records they may have available for them. And some of the records may be on database too. And you just add, and like uh, that one church record, Matricula, you can just look, you know, down to the church record and get a date and see if that record might be available for that particular I also put a link um, to the Family Search Wiki all about finding the town of origin, um, specifically, specifically um, for Germans. So hopefully that will give you some ideas that maybe you haven't checked into yet to try to find that original town or village where your ancestors came from. One more question we've got is, um, is there a good website or book on German history that can help identify conquests by the German empire over time to help us identify when different kingdoms were conquered or annexed that can help with historical roots? I would use German, uh, that one book I was showing you is Germanic Genealogy. That's really a pretty good book, too. Uh, they have a later version. Mine's an earlier version book, but they have a later version, too. And um, that can give you some good background information um, and good historical background uh, on, on German history. And there's other books as well that you can find on, on German history. It's, um, uh, you know, it's... It, it, I wouldn't say it's the it, somewhat complicated, I suppose, when you look at it that way. But uh, I think you can find some records that uh, or some books out there that have it. But uh, uh, the one book that I was mentioning, I'm looking right at it right now as I'm looking over the my bookcase, uh, Germanic Genealogy is what it's called. 
think those were all the questions we had today, okay. unless anybody has any last minute questions. Once again, thank you so much, Dave, for all your well, wonderful knowledge and insight into hopefully tracking down some of our German ancestors. Thank again, you very hope much. Everyone will join us for our last session of the year, December 9th. We will um, host Robin M. Smith, who is going to be talking about putting all your research together, making sense of all the research you've done up until this point. So hopefully a lot of tips and pointers on what to do with all that research you've already done to, you know, make heads or tails of it and, um, you know, research a little bit more effectively um, going forward. Again, a reminder that we have our YouTube channel where we have some past Find Your Ancestors sessions on there. I posted a couple links. There was one um, that we did on German maps and gazetteers a couple years ago that was awesome. There was one on Czech archives that you know Dave had mentioned earlier a little bit about Czech archives. We have a great one that we did last fall that that video is still on our YouTube channel. Um, so I did post a link. Specifically, we have um, a whole playlist on all of our Find Your Ancestors um, videos on there that I posted in the chat. And again, I will send out a recording link and a link to the chat on Monday to everyone. So you can access this all again and enjoy. Any other final words from anybody? I don't see just a lot of thank you and everyone saying time to work on those brick walls now. Hopefully this helps out a lot for a lot of folks and uh, um, good luck to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you as well. And uh, thank you again, Katie and, and the Appleton Public Library. And uh, I've uh, hopefully my experience has helped out a few people too in their research. And it's um, uh, German records is very fascinating. And it's uh, when you find that one record, um, it's always a thrill. Absolutely. Don't give up the hunt. You'll find them eventually. You know, they just Keep might be hiding it. a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, everyone, take care. We'll see you in December. Thank you very much.